We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 4. Uh, we've been working through the book of Acts, you guys know, for quite some time now. And now we're getting to uh, another climactic situation in the book. But before we get there, I want to share a personal story with you guys. I grew up uh, playing football. There was nothing better in life than, to me than to play football. I love the fact that I got a chance to go and hit people as a defender and not get in trouble for doing that. And so one of the most impressive things about football is that when you stop your opponent from crossing that line of scrimmage or when you cause them to lose yards or if you cause a turnover, like as a defender, there's nothing better than that. And when I think about great all-time defenders, I'm going to show my age here a little bit. I think about LT, Lawrence Taylor, one of the hardest hitting um, uh, linebackers in the league's history. I think about Ray Lewis. I think about Junior Seau. And my personal all-time favorite, the hardest-hitting strong safety in the history of the pigskin being played, put it up there for me, John Lynch. John Lynch is my all-time favorite defender. He played for the Buccaneers, and there was no one who hit harder than John Lynch. That's my opinion, and I'm entitled to it, Tony, so forget you. <laughs> Speaking of getting hit, uh, did you guys know that one of the most devastating hits you can take in football is what they call a blind side? And being blindsided is exactly what it sounds like. You're looking this way, and then someone comes and hits you from this side, and you get knocked out. And the reason why it's so devastating is because you don't have time to prepare for the hit. You can't tense up. You can't make adjustments. It just comes out of nowhere. And when you get blindsided, you're at, your, you're at, the, other, you're at the other person's mercy. There's no time to brace for impact. And the, result, <clears throat> the results can be life-altering. And typically, when a player gets blindsided in a game, it's not just the physical part, but it's also the mental part. Because what happens is now that guy is looking for that guy who blindsided him earlier in the game. And so his attention is off the game itself. You see, I think that this is a good opening story or illustration, if you will, because I think that all of us can raise our hands if I asked you to and say, you know what, Pastor? I've been blindsided. Life was going this way. And everything was looking good, everything was looking great, and then out of nowhere, everything fell apart. All of us could answer this question or fill this blank in. We could all say this. We all have stories like, like, like these, where is, yeah, it's on the screen. Things were going great until you fill in the blank. Life was going great until I failed the SATs. Life was going the way that I wanted it to go until my, my, my sweetheart broke up with me. Life was going good until my company decided they, they didn't need me anymore. Life was going good until my child disrespected me. My marriage was perfect and everything was, was going the way God had planned it until we found out that we couldn't have babies of our own. Life was good until I found out that the person who I trained in the position that we were in together got promoted over me. And as a result of getting knocked down, as a result of getting blindsided, as a result of things not going your way, you stepped back and you decided to commiserate. You decided to, to have a pity party. Or maybe you decided that you don't want to play the game anymore whatsoever because I don't want to be hurt again. You see, the hurt you experienced has paralyzed you. And I've been here. And you don't know what to do. You don't know how to move forward. Maybe you've lost hope. If that's you, if any of those things describe you or you can resonate with any of those things, I want you to hear this on this morning. This message is for you. If you've ever been caught off guard regarding your faith, this message is for you. If you feel like the literal rug has been pulled out from underneath you and you're laying flat on your back, looking up at the ceiling, not knowing which way to go, this message is for you. If you feel like what's the point in trying to do better, this message is for you. Here's our big idea. The words down and out are not in God's vocabulary. Neither should they be in yours. The words down and out, to stay in that situation, to stay in that place, they're not in God's vocabulary, and they shouldn't be in our vocabulary. There's no such thing as down and out, as a down and out Christian. Any adversity you experience is just another opportunity for God to display his awesome power, for God to display his sovereignty over creation. It's another opportunity for God to comfort you and to remind you that he is near and he is dear and he sees you and he has you. It's another opportunity for God to blow your mind with his grace. 
You may be down right now, but you certainly are not out. And you may be wondering, all right, Pastor, we've been talking about all these positive things in the book of Acts up to this point. Why would you uh, make a hard left turn on us? Why would you turn left, left unexpectedly and, and start talking about negative things, suffering things, things that don't feel good, things that, that just don't make sense as we've been looking at the rest of the scripture? Why would you do that to us? We've seen some amazing things happening in Acts up until this point. Why would you derail our thought process like this, Pastor? We've seen Peter preaching boldly. And as a result of that, and the Holy Spirit working in people's lives, we've seen thousands of people come to faith. That's dynamic growth. We've seen some amazing miracles being performed, only things that God could do. And we also learned in Acts 2.42 through 47, the amazing, mind-blowing unity and generosity that was held by that first century church. And we said, we desire that. We crave that. We want that also. Everything up to this point in the book of Acts has been awesome. Everything is perfect, and there is no drama, at least until today. This single solitary event that we're getting ready to read about is consistent with Christianity going forward. Peter and John are getting ready to get knocked out. They get blindsided. They're doing the Lord's will. They're doing what God has told them to do. And out of nowhere, they're getting ready to get blindsided. But here's the amazing thing. Yeah, they get knocked out. And as you're going to see, they don't stay down. So if you haven't opened your Bibles already, open with me to Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1. A lot of scripture today. I want you guys to read this, to um, ingest it, and let it work on you from the inside out. This is what it says, verse 1. <clears throat> While they were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them, Peter and John, that is. They seized them and took them into custody until the next day. It was already evening. But many of those who heard the message, love this, many of those who heard the message, heard the gospel, and the number of men came to about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes, they assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family, verse 7. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them. By what power or in what name have you done this? You healed this lame man. We get that. But by what power or in whose name have you done this? The leaders listed here, they're hostile to the gospel. They're not curious about the gospel. They're not gospel seekers, but these men are hostile. They literally hate the gospel because the gospel is Jesus Christ. And these are the same people, you need to know this, these are the same people who just recently murdered Jesus. They called for Jesus to be arrested, illegally tried, and crucified. These are the same people. And they're also the ruling, the ruling powers of Judaism there um, in Jerusalem. They're part of a council called the Sanhedrin Council. So in terms of religion, in terms of people who have religious power, there's no one higher than these guys. And they call Peter and John because they want to question them. They want to question them about the resurrection. And there's also some, some political agenda stuff happening here. You see, the, the Sanhedrin council, these men, they were offended by the gospel because they, the, Peter and John were proclaiming res, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Sanhedrin didn't believe in a resurrection. The Sanhedrin didn't believe in that. So they, they, they fought that tooth and nail. They viewed them as being heretics. And then I would argue this is the bigger reason, the political one. There was this careful balance between the Jews and the Romans. The Romans were their overlords. They were the ruling power over the Jews. And the last thing the Sanhedrin Council wanted to have happen was for this careful balance where they were treated somewhat fairly to be disrupted. And by thousands of people coming to faith and proclaiming Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, that was upsetting things. And so they want to squash the whole thing. The first seven verses remind us that Christianity will only be tolerated by our culture. At best, our faith, this thing called Christianity, this thing that we live by, this thing that we dedicate so much of our time and our energy and our resources to, at best, it will only ever be tolerated by our culture. It will never be embraced. 
Therefore, those of us who profess Jesus as Lord of all, we can expect persecution. I wish I didn't have to tell you that. I wish I didn't have to talk about this, but we can expect to be persecuted. We can expect to be treated as, as, as less than. We can expect to be treated unfairly. Something I love about Christianity, and I never thought about this until a few days ago, is that Christianity levels the playing field amongst the people. Regardless if you're black, white, if you're Hawaiian, if you're Asian, if you're Hispanic, if you're a girl or a boy, male or female, if you're Asian, uh, it makes no difference. If you profess Jesus Christ, the same people who, 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 who hate white Christians are the same people who hate black Christians. It levels the playing field. We're all considered a minority. Never thought about that before. But that's what it is, the body of Christ. People are only willing to tolerate what agrees with their belief system. And any time they think that someone is going to challenge what they believe, challenge their core convictions, that's going to show them a better way, and they don't want to do that, they can become hostile, and tensions begin to, to rise. And if tensions aren't resolved, it can boil over, as in the case here. And as those things stay, and people don't deal with the tension that they feel inside of themselves, they can lash out. And Peter and John, they get challenged. They get challenged by these religious leaders. They didn't set out to be challenged. They didn't set out to be arrested. They didn't set out to be in trouble. But this is what happened. They were being obedient to God. And even though they're doing what the Lord wanted them to do, which was healing the lame man and preaching the gospel, these two men have landed in the hot seat. Back to the text. Verse 7 again. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them. By what power or in what name have you done this? And then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. I love that. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, he said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is a stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. And he goes on, he says, therefore, uh, there is salvation. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Now, I'm not a lawyer, never been to law school, never wanted to be a lawyer. I was a plumber and now I'm a pastor, love what I do, but never ever understood law whatsoever. But I'm pretty sure that if you're going to be your own attorney in a court case, right, like you wouldn't go about it this way. I watched like the, the court TV shows like, you know, Judge Judy, watch Law and Order. And so I have a, a little bit of a working knowledge, but not a lot. But I've never seen a defendant go before the prosecuting attorney and also the, 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 the judge, in this case, the Sanhedrin Council, and accuse them of being murderers. He's like, you guys killed the Messiah. You guys did away with the you rejected the cornerstone the bedrock of our faith, you did this. Peter stands and he boldly preaches a three-point sermon. It's clear, it's simple, and it's urgent. He's like, you want to know who, he who healed this lame man? You want to know what's really going on here? I'll tell you who's responsible. Point number one, Jesus healed the lame beggar. The paralytic guy didn't heal himself. Point number two, Jesus is alive and he has complete authority. Point number three, Jesus is the Messiah. Only he can forgive sins and save souls. And then the conclusion is this, and this is what they had to come to. Jesus is the only bridge to God. To, de to deny Jesus is to deny God. To deny God is to deny Jesus. I love the fact that Peter is bold. I love the fact that he's consistent. And when I say consistent, I mean that he didn't change up his message or his delivery method because he's in front of these religious elitists. If you look back, if we were to do this, go back to the day of Pentecost in chapter 2, it's the exact same content, the exact same message, the exact same gospel being proclaimed. The same three points. If you go back to Solomon's colonnade that we learned about a few days ago when the, um, when the lame man has been healed in chapter 3, Peter preaches the exact same gospel. He's consistent. And now he's standing before people who have the power to have him put to death, and he delivers the exact same message. 
Jesus forgives sin. Jesus is the giver of life. He doesn't back up. He doesn't shy away from the hard truth. He's like, it's Jesus. Jesus. And he could have skirted the hard truth, but instead he stands, he stands firm. The Holy Spirit emboldened him. He didn't do it on his own. God strengthened him so that he could withstand this trial that he's currently in. Peter is being interrogated by some of the most powerful people in the land, yet he stands. He stands. And he has John by his side and also the lame guy who just got healed. Like Peter, let me encourage you to stand firm in your faith no matter what. Like Peter, let me encourage you to stand firm in your faith no matter what. If you're a Christian, be a Christian. Keep it 100. Like, like don't flip-flop back and forth. Christianity is not a thing you turn on today and you turn off on tomorrow. Represent your Savior no matter who's looking, no matter who's around, no matter what's going on. That's what Peter and John did. They could have backed up. They could have backed out. They could have denied Jesus in order to save their own skin, yet they stayed true. They had no idea what the future held for them. They had no idea what was going to happen to them, yet we see that they stand firm. What do you guys think the verdict is going to be? What do you think the council is going to say, the Sanhedrin council is going to say to Peter and John about their bold actions? Remember, these are the same guys who didn't like Jesus. These are the same guys who are trying to extinguish Christianity as a whole. Let's find out. Verse 13 says this. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated, untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Verse 15, after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves. So they went back and they deliberated. Like, what are we going to do about this? What should we do? Uh, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, they say, let's threaten them. Let's, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name. So they call for them and order them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you got to decide that, bro. You have to decide that. But as for me, uh, I am unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard after threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. Even the Sanhedrin council came to the conclusion that Peter and John were right. They had insight into the scriptures and they were right. The, 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 the Sanhedrin council, they're like rendered speechless. Not only that, but they have living proof that Jesus healed this man because the healed man is standing there with them. He's living, breathing proof of that. And so after deliberating for a while, they conclude that it's better to let them go because if they keep them in custody, they risk an uprising. They risk people like going crazy and chanting and wanting to have Peter and John released. And realizing that they could do nothing else, the council threatened the men not to speak Jesus' name anymore as if that was going to do anything, and they turned them loose. Essentially, here's the picture. Peter and John and also this lame guy who's been healed, they get away with a slap on the wrist. The apostles, they get knocked down, but they don't get knocked out. They get back up, and they get busy doing what they were called to do. They get busy standing firm for the Lord. You see, the key to their success can be found in verse 8, where it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what this means here is not that Peter needed a new Holy Spirit or his spirit had run out. It means that Peter acted under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told Peter to go and to preach this gospel this way, to do these things. The Holy Spirit emboldened Peter and gave him the strength to stand strong. And so at this point, I hope you guys are like, okay, 
You started out talking about how we have to, how we get knocked out sometimes, we have to get back up and all that great stuff. But now we're talking about Peter and John standing before this, this council that we don't know that much about. Like, what does this mean for us, Pastor? What do we do with this? How can we apply these truths to our lives? Will we be called to defend our faith before the Supreme Court? Possibly, but not likely, not all of us. Here's the greater principle I want, you to, I want to share with you. And once you have this principle, I think it's going to help you tremendously. Here it is. Write this down. With the Holy Spirit in you, down is never out. The Spirit will see you through. With the Holy Spirit in you, down is never out. The Spirit will see you through. Uh, this has been a ridiculously difficult year for a lot of us. And I'll be the first one to say that it's been stupid, crazy, ridiculously hard for me and my family. Given the fact that we're trying to establish a church and given the fact that trying to raise kids and career stuff and all that, like life is hard right now. And I've heard some of your stories and all of us could raise our hands in one accord and say, life is hard right now. The only reason why we haven't, the only reason why I haven't lost my mind is because God has kept us grounded. And he gives us the ability to endure when we want to give up. He gives us the strength when we are weak. He gives us the grace that we need to make it day by day by day. He does that for all of us. Whether you see it or realize it, I want you to know that he does that for each and every one of us. When I started this message, I asked, I said, if you feel like you've been knocked down or you don't know what to do next, this message is for you. You see, Peter, he gets knocked down, arrested, made to stand before the Supreme Court, and he's ordered to not preach Jesus anymore. Yet we see him standing firm. We see him getting back up. We see him persevering. Like one of those mayhem commercials for Allstate, right? Life happens, doesn't it? And life just keeps happening. Like we want to push the pause button on life sometimes, but it's just like you're minding your business somewhere out of nowhere. Mayhem happens. Life just happens. We just get blindsided. We can't stop it from happening, but we can do something about it. We don't have to be, be, become a, a, a whipping boy or a punching bag. We can do something about it. We can learn how to get back up when we get knocked down. And so to help us with this, I went to a trusted scholar who knows more about getting back up once he gets knocked down than any of us collectively do. Next slide, please, Renee. This is what Rocky Balboa has to say about the whole situation. You laugh, but this is some good stuff here. He's, this is from, his, from the movie Balboa. He says, let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. If a very mean and it's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life, but it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you, can, you get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's from Rocky. I grew up reading and hearing chants and quotes and idle, uh, ideas like this. And to some degree, I, I agree with this. I agree you need to get up and keep moving forward, but in, in this charge, in, in, in this pressing by Rocky, like, it's kind of empty. Like, okay, this is things we need to be doing. I, I get that, but how do we practically do it? I want to share with you five practical ways that you can get up when you get knocked down. I think they're on your sheet. Here's five practical ways. I'll try to explain them um, a little bit more so you can have more meat to go home and think about. Number one, these are all under the assumption that you're in your Bible daily. These are all under the, the assumption that you, are, um, that you are praying each and every day. These aren't just, let's skip the Bible, let's skip our time with the Lord and just get to doing the practical things. But no, these are added on to the practical things of reading your Bible and praying first. Here's the first one. See it as a chance to grow. Sometimes when you get knocked down, sometimes when life gets really stupid hard and you don't know what to do, sometimes it's a chance for you to step back and to view it for what it is. It's a chance to grow. Maybe you need to improve in a certain area of your life. Maybe you need to overcome something that's been holding you back. Let go of something that's been holding you back. I think sometimes we want to remain who we are today, but we, 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 we desire and we crave to be a better person on tomorrow, but we won't let go of who we are on today. You have to let go of some stuff so that you can step into who God wants you to be on tomorrow. Number two, step back and analyze the situation. I wrestle with this one. 
I'm always like, give me the next thing I need to do. Let's get after it. But to stop and to analyze it and to think about it objectively, what went right, what went wrong, what can we do differently? Like I wrestle with that. But it's so valuable for us to step back so that we don't keep making the same mistakes, to step back and to analyze our situation. What needs to change? It could be better if, if I had a different plan, a different system. Maybe if I went back to school, if I cut some things out or I added some things in. Number three, how about owning your wrong and be honest with yourself? Man, sometimes we can analyze a situation and we like, oh, that's that person's fault. If I only had this, this wouldn't have happened. But how about owning your wrong in the situation, owning the wrong that caused you to be where you're currently at today, that currently, the thing that currently knocked you out? When things don't go as planned, it's easy for us to rationalize the situation. It's easy for us to excuse certain elements away. Look at the information objectively that's in front of you and own your mistakes. If there were five parts that you had to do and you only did three parts, well, a big chunk of that is up to you. Number four, get help. This is hard for some of us. If you could do it on your own and be successful and be effective, you would have. You wouldn't have gotten knocked down. You need people to help you get to where you want to be. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing weak. There's nothing silly about asking for help. But we need to learn how to ask for help. And then once we ask for it, like receive the, the, the guidance that the person is trying to give us. Sometimes people reach out to me and they're like, hey, we just want to help you with so-and-so, Douglas. It's like, oh, I got it. That's wrong. I don't got it. It's like I'm spinning three plates and I'm, I got one here, one here. And I got a, a plate that's spinning on my forehead. It's like, I, I got all these. Like, no, I don't. And some of you have been there as well. Don't be like the guy who went to the hospital to get checked out because he was having heart problems and he began to fight the doctors. The doctor's checking him out. Like, don't be that person. Receive the help that's being given to you. Number five, gain strength from your past knockdowns. All of us have been knocked down before, right? And we've all seen God's grace in our lives, over our lives, and people helping us and all of that. Like, we should gain strength. We should gain motivation by revisiting some of our past knockdowns and applying some of those principles to our current situation. We can gain strength and encouragement by looking back at something that God has helped us through previously to, to encourage us as we move forward. So those are five practical things we can do uh, to get back up when we get knocked down. Life is going to keep happening, guys. And the more and more you grow, the more and more you mature, the more and more that you learn, the more difficult life is going to become. Christianity has never been, neither will it ever be a popular thing. We need to learn how to, how to take a hit and keep it moving. Loved ones, hear me when I say this. Uh, the words down and out are not in God's vocabulary, and neither should they be in yours. You may have come in here in a down state, but please hear me when I say, like, you are not out. You could be laying down right, you could be laying down right now, you could be upset right now, but you are not out of the game. God has you. He loves you. God is keeping you. The only reason why you're not, like, literally out is because God has kept you all this time. He does that through the power of his Holy Spirit. He does that through the power of the Holy Spirit that he's placed inside of each and every one of us. Pick yourself back up. Do what needs to be done and keep it moving forward for God's glory. He gets no glory, no fame, no accolades from a down and out Christian who's sitting there on the sidelines, sucking, them, sucking their thumb, saying, woe is me. Let's pray.